book. I I simply uh, did a little bit of facilitation on uh, on either end, but of course we're uh, really exploring how uh, this textbook, Contemporary Issues in Collection Management, came to be, and so we'll walk people through the the background and the story, and uh, and hear from everybody involved. Uh, of course, as we begin, and Manisha, you've got me now thinking we don't have a water acknowledgement; we just have a land acknowledgement. But all five of us. Uh, I live and work in Amiskwichi, Wiskayagan, uh, which is the Treaty 6 territory, Métis Region 4. Of course, this land is the historic, current, and future home of a diverse range of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Uh, of course, when acknowledging the land, I think it's important to connect it to the, the purpose uh, for which it's being used, uh, both in the, the class uh, that I taught, which, which gave the kind of genesis for this book, uh, and in the kind of current context, it's, uh, it's educational. Uh, and I think, you know, anytime we're thinking of, of uh, education, it's, it's easy to see that connection, uh, both with the residential and day system and, uh, and the genocide against Indigenous peoples, uh, but also a path forward. And I really uh, always am inspired by TRC Commissioner and Senator Murray Sinclair's comment about uh, education got us into this mess and education will get us out of this mess. Uh, and I think that's something really important to think about uh, today and especially as we head into uh, Saturday as well. Uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge as well, anytime we're talking about open education to, uh, to really highlight the work Manisha and uh, Maskwishi's Cultural College have done. She's been a real uh, leader across the country in bringing people together and, and creating forms for like this where we can discuss things. So in terms of the outline, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the context of this. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kat and Amy. They'll talk a little bit about uh, the course and the post-course uh, flow. And uh, then from there, uh, we'll cover uh, some of the insights and reflections. Winston and Marty have uh, have a couple uh, really sharp uh, insights that they'll uh, share with us. So, uh, you know, the, the foundation, the thinking behind all of this is, uh, is open pedagogy and, uh, and, of course, its relationship to uh, open educational resources. Uh, there's been a real interest in open pedagogy over the past 10 years, uh, give or take, and it's come out of the open educational resource movement. Uh, there's a lot of different frameworks for open pedagogy, sometimes open, sometimes called open educational practices, sometimes just called open education. Uh, that being said, there's a, a few kind of really useful frameworks uh, on the bottom left hand side here. That's uh, Hegarty's eight attribute uh, approach to, uh, to open pedagogy. Uh, doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on open educational resources, but uh, you know places emphasis in other places like learner generated, peer review, uh, participatory technology, reflective practice, innovation, creativity, uh, and we'll see how some of those play out. Uh, of course, Cronin has done a really good job at looking at uh, you know open educational practices uh, and what those involve for teachers. You know, that thinking about uh, trust, privacy, digital literacy. Uh, Michael Pascovicius, who's out at the University of Victoria. Uh, probably has, I think, one of the sharpest, uh, you know, single definitions around uh, what open pedagogy applies and, and thinking about it, uh, not just in relation to uh, an assignment and, and, and what might come out of it, but the development of learning outcomes uh, and the whole kind of all the elements of teaching. Uh, and the one piece I want to draw on kind of last here is David Wiley. Uh, David Wiley, of course, foundational to the open educational resource movement. Uh, he really came up with this work early on about uh, this idea of disposable assignments and, uh, and authentic assignments. And so, uh, you know, getting away from these assignments where, you know, put them in a syllabus so that the students do it, I mark it, and it goes back to the student, they might read the comments, and then we both throw it into a recycling bin, whether that's a digital recycling bin or a physical recycling bin, and really moving towards authentic assignments where you have students do things uh, like they would do in real life, or or even broader contribute uh, kind of resources. So uh, Wiley's thinking around, you know, how can I get away from just doing assessment for the purpose of assessment? Because that's not really a good use of uh, students' time or my time uh, with some of the thinking here. Also inspired by the Association for College and Research Libraries, ACRL, uh, and their framework for information literacy in higher education. Uh, and they've been, you know, encouraging uh, folks to think about uh, the way students are contributors to scholarly discussions. So they're co-creators of knowledge uh, and they are, you know, maybe junior, but certainly participants in scholarly conversations. And in the case of this book, uh, they're the experts, uh, not, uh, not me. Uh, that being said, it's, you know, it's easy to, to look at a lot of positives here, but there are some important concerns about open pedagogy. Uh, 
obviously, I think the most salient one is anytime you're you're using labor, particularly free labor, and in this case, student labor, uh, there's a big risk for exploitation. Another big consideration is power dynamics involved. Uh, you know, professors have a lot of power, uh, and they should not use that to kind of unduly co uh, coerce students. Uh, so some of that thinking was involved. Uh, and recognizing, too, that, that this is all done on the side of everyone's desk. Uh, no one is going to earn a dime from this textbook. Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, you know, free labor and, and time that went into this project. Uh, so this came out of a class uh, that I taught last uh, fall, LIS 531, Collection Management. It's a graduate course at the School of Library and Information Studies. Uh, as I was getting ready, I found there were some really good textbooks. There's really good introductory textbooks on collection management, uh, but there's not a lot of open resources. And in fact, that uh, even spills into the, the journal article side of things. I think collections librarians just kind of think that you can buy everything. So uh, less emphasis, it seemed, on, uh, on OER. Uh, and so I thought, you know, well, wouldn't it be interesting if, if there was a way to construct something that might be usable uh, next year? And so uh, over here on the, uh, the right hand side, that's actually the table of contents uh, from the book. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give away the ending that that book and every one of those chapters is on the syllabus uh, this year. So we were able to, uh, to kind of see things through. There were some real important factors uh, that shaped how this was uh, was able to work, and and some of these are replicable, and some of these are irreplicable, and I think that's really important. So the number one thing was the rapport with students. I walked into that classroom. Uh, there were 22 students. I taught 21 of them before. The only one was Winston, who I hadn't taught. So I kind of had a sense that you know I don't have to spend the first week or two or three developing trust. People are going to know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm able to propose something a little bit more uh, out of the box. Uh, and in fact, I wrote in the syllabus a statement about pedagogy uh, saying that I was informed by these kind of ideas uh, and that I was clearly not uh, you know, going to be the, the expert matter in this, uh, the subject matter expert in this. Uh, another key piece uh, was the ability to have a publishing platform. And so, uh, a lot of work has been done by University of Alberta and its partners in Open Education Alberta to develop uh, press books instances that can be used uh, kind of by many institutions across the province uh, to develop textbooks. And so I knew I had to build a textbook uh, and not just simply a collection of essays or articles. Uh, and so that was, uh, you know, having that technology available was a key enabler. Uh, and the last one, it may seem rather strange. But the fact I knew virtually nothing about collection management when I was assigned to teach the course was a, a real enabler for this. Uh, I was able to uh, you know, kind of go in on the first week and I told the students, I am not an expert. I'm going to learn with you. This is open pedagogy. Whatever you write on, you're going to know more about than me at the end of the day. And that was absolutely uh, true. I think it also enabled me to kind of facilitate the process uh, more in a more functional way. If they had have written on, say, telecom policy or copyright policy, I probably would have had a really high bar, which said, oh, they, you know, this might not be uh, suitable for, uh, for publication. Instead, I approached it as, you know, we're writing a textbook. It's a teaching material. If, you, if I'm learning something from this, then that is, it's a, it's a useful material for others as well. And so it really worked, uh, perhaps that I wasn't uh, like a huge expert on all of this. Uh, there are some important barriers, uh, and some of these are quite useful barriers, too. Uh, one is the University of Alberta's policy. Uh, I cannot, as much as I may want to by times, force students to openly license their uh, schoolwork. It's uh, as copyright holders, the students are the creators of their work, uh, they get to decide what is done with their uh, course materials. And so, as you'll see, uh, we weren't able to produce the textbook the day after the course ended or anything like that. We had to do some thinking about uh, how that might work, uh, but really recognizing and respecting that, that students are the masters of their own work. Uh, open Education Alberta policy was also a little bit of a challenge. Uh, it did require a little bit of uh, self-licensing and, and some process that, that made the uh, time a little bit longer. Uh, and as I said, it did kind of constrain. It, uh, I was really told that I had to write a textbook for a course or, or facilitate uh, the creation of a textbook for a course. It couldn't just be uh, a series of essays. 
Uh, and that last one, and I think the biggest piece uh, for myself and, and for many of the students involved uh, was the lack of time or funding. So, uh, you know, the, the students had to work uh, on this in the course. They did work afterwards. I did work afterwards. Uh, we published the book just at the beginning of August. And I know by that point, I was pretty done with going through the book and trying to do uh, editing and, and things like that. Uh, so it would be, you know, great if in the future there might be uh, funding for you know, one student even to do some of that editorial work, for example. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kat and uh, Amy, who are going to talk a little bit about the course process and then what happened after the course. Um, thank you. So the assignment itself was split into three parts throughout the entire course. Uh, those are the draft chapter, the peer review, and the final chapter. I think overall it was a really flexible format. We had the option to work on our own or in groups of up to three. There was no word count or page count. And we were able to choose our own topics, obviously, per Michael's approval. Um, and I think that was really helpful because for students who did want to work on their own, they didn't have to meet the same word count as someone who was working with two other people. Um, and also being able to choose your own topic was really helpful for people because uh, they would be actually interested in what they were talking about, which I know is sometimes not the case for school assignments, obviously. For me, I am obsessed with ebook pricing and I got to write a 20 page paper on ebook pricing. And I think for a lot of other people, they ended up writing a little bit more than they expected to just because they were really interested in researching and continuing to learn about the subject that they were working on. Um, so the part with the most weight was the draft, but it was made very clear from the beginning. It didn't have to be a fully realized version that just needed a few edits. I worked with Kat uh, for the paper and ours had multiple sections where we just left notes saying, what do you guys think about expanding on this? Or should we maybe add in an extra section on this? And we just asked for the opinions for our, from our peer reviewers and Michael, and we got some really good feedback. And I think that really emphasizes the peer review process. Hello, um, I'm Kat. Uh, Testing, is this working? Yes, great. Um, so yeah, the peer review process really reinforced the constructive analysis of the writing, um, both in terms of structure and content. Uh, each group had their work reviewed by the same number of people as there were authors. Uh, so Amy and I as co-writers had our chapter reviewed by two classmates, as well as Michael. Um, it was made clear too within the peer review process that edits were merely suggestions, and we as writers had the ultimate say in what editing path to follow. Um, it was really interesting to hear a variety of feedback and to see how different people interpreted the chapter that we wrote. Um, of course, there were some commonalities in the feedback that we got, um, so it supported us in making specific edits. Um, in the slides, you could see uh, the first page of our draft that Michael marked, um, so you could see that there was a lot of feedback <laughs> provided. Uh, there was a kind of I found fun aspect of the peer review, which was the ability to share resources with our reviewees, and that was specifically part of the rubric for the peer review. Um, and the paper I reviewed had a fairly related topic to the one that we had written. Uh, I think I got really lucky with that. Not everyone um, had that, but it meant that I was actually able to provide some articles that we'd found from our own chapter for the person who'd written it, which was kind of fun. And it was nice to see that they did actually get used uh, in the final product. Uh, kind of one final comment on the peer review is that it is supposed to be double blind, hence why it's in quotations on the slide. Um, but because our class was so small, obviously we only had 22 people. Um, a lot of people did know who they were reviewing. Uh, I don't think personally that it was a problem because all of us were really professional, but it is definitely worth thinking about if it is something that you're going to do. Um, next slide. So after the course was over, we had kind of a cooling off period before we got to back to working on our chapters. Uh, this course was done during fall, so for a lot of us, we still were in school come the winter semester, and so we had to work on our own coursework, and so obviously that cooling off period also helped us 
not have added stress of working on a published book. Uh, some groups did find that they worked well together. Kat and I were really able to use Google Docs to make edits and talk to each other. And we were able to make time to, after the class had finished to work on it, um, which I think we were also, again, lucky in that. Yeah. Um, throughout the editing process, there were many occasions where we had to revisit and update the information that we had originally provided. Um, for those of us able to access press books, it was relatively easy to edit our works. Um, for our chapter, there was a few topics that we touched on that had evolved between the first draft submission and the publishing of it. Um, notably, the day after our first draft was submitted, um, one of the topics that we had talked about was the U.S. Department of Justice blocking the Penguin Random House merger. And so that decision was made the day after we submitted our draft. So we had to update that uh, with uh, the new context uh, in our chapter. Um, we had written about it, but of course did not know the outcome while writing. Um, same with the results of the Hachette versus Internet Archive case that was announced in the spring. Um, those things had to be updated in our chapter as well. Um, sometimes it felt like I was a little panicked that we might have some outdated information um, since we had originally written the first draft almost 10 months before the actual publishing. Um, I also had some time after the class was finished to source editing our opinions from other library professionals outside of the U of A. Um, a former coworker of mine who has their MLIS was able to read um, Amy and my first draft uh, and offer some, or final draft, sorry, and offer some insight um, as someone reading it from a public library perspective. And they let me know that they found it to be extremely informative. So I think that the chapters that we wrote in the book in general broadly answer some specific questions um, and provides uh, library professionals some of the details and the nuance in relation to the book subject matters and being open. It's open educational resources. It's very accessible. Um, so this allows this information um, to be able that for libraries professionals to be able to access it and to be able to better explain the topics to anyone asking them these questions, um, bringing together all the current resource research into one resource that is open for all to read. Uh, so also throughout this process, Michael was continually updating us through emails about the press book process and anything we had to figure out as a group, such as the licensing. We also had to have um, similar, similar editing styles. So I think for Kat and I, we had numbered all of our sections, but we decided ultimately to make it um, synchronous with everyone else that we would remove those and so forth. We actually had a document for that. Um, that everyone, it was shared with everyone, so everyone could make sure that it looked the same. Uh, and he also asked if anyone would be interested in designing the cover for the book. So yeah, um, Michael has sent out a request for cover ideas, um, and it was loaded out to all contributors. A few of us had the idea to create a word cloud of all the essays within the collection to make a cover. So Amy, mostly had that word cloud idea um, and the word cloud was generated from the input of all the chapters uh, using a free online site that filtered the top 50 words we manually added some of the main subject words for each chapter um, Winston designed the book image and then all three of us sort of played around with various layout and design options the cover itself was made through canva as for their free content license and the book line design on the cover represents both digital and physical books with other design elements supporting the connectedness of the topic, uh, which you can see have all been incorporated into these slides as well. Um, as a group, we chose to license the cover the same as the book, um, which was under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial 4.0 international license. And so that sums up the steps taken in creating this open educational resource. And now Winston is gonna speak more on the value of the process. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, wanted to just share some of the insights on the impact this um, project had on us as students pedagogically. Uh, by no means am I speaking for all the students, but I think I can share some of the themes that came up in discussions in the class. Uh, I titled this slide, Higher Stakes, Higher Pressure, Higher Value. Uh, so uh, certainly this was one of the funnest uh, projects that I got to, uh, I've got to work on in my grad school so far. But uh, some things to keep in mind uh, if you're thinking of bringing this into your class, uh, but we'll just touch on some of these. So uh, sort of have jokingly written out this as stages as we sort of processed the idea of this project. 
Um, stage one, sort of when we first heard about the project, I think in typical grad student fashion, it was like, cool, we can get a, pres a, a publishing credit and something on our CV out of this. And uh, so, but that was uh, quickly followed by the second stage I'm calling it, which is wait, so this is gonna be publicly available. Uh, I think that actually changed our approach to our learning in our class quite a bit in that uh, everything was al already from the beginning a little more with this focus on a wider audience. And so um, certainly for me, it's like, oh, how is this gonna impact how I write this thing from the beginning as we were even doing our research and learning. So um, as we started then working on the project, uh, Amy and Kat talked about the, the draft process and the double blind. Um, I, I think very much a lot of us had this third grade stage reaction of cool, it won't just be our prof reading this. Um, I think for a lot of us as students, we sort of uh, have got this mode of well, we just need to write whatever the prof is expecting, or we just need to tick the boxes of here are the assignments we need to get done. Here's the word count we need to meet. Um, the idea that, oh, it won't be just the prof uh, was an interesting switch to how we approach the project. Again, this waffling back and forth right away with the fourth stage of wait, it won't be just our prof reading this. Um, all of a sudden, it wasn't just about meeting um, the criteria of one reader uh, in sort of a, almost a no stakes, low stakes, it, it's good for the points to your class, but no other uh, uh, repercussions, if you will, for it. And the fact that there may be other people reading it uh, was a big shift. Uh, it was uh, really cool to have, therefore, that um, initial um, internal peer reading process where, yeah, even as we were writing the draft, we were writing not just to... Uh, meet the standards or the uh, rubric for a prof, but for a potential audience of some of our classmates. And so uh, as we moved into uh, the actual writing the book, and this, I think for different people at different times, um, as we were putting out the final draft, and especially as the class ended and the project continued, it's like, oh yeah, this is clearly not just about the class, not just about the marks. We already have the mark for the class. We passed. It's None of that is what's at stake. Um, so I, I marked out as fifth stage, cool, we can really make this into something useful. The idea that this was something that was not an assignment, it really was beyond an assignment to something that would go out to hopefully help other students uh, was made, made it uh, a lot more uh, of value, I think, to us to continue participating in the project. But then, uh, as we were doing that work, uh, I jokingly called a six stage wait. Michael tricked us into writing and learning way more than we otherwise would. And the idea, um, uh, Kat and Amy mentioned that, you know, they took it to peer review with actual working professionals that uh, we kept reviewing, oh, there's, we found another reference. We came across another article. Should we keep updating our paper? Um, uh, another one that was very interesting is the, the um, process of making it an open educational resource required us to also meet a higher standard for accessibility and things like that. So uh, in, the, uh, in the chapter that I co-wrote, we actually had a figure, a chart, and part of accessibility requirements is having a long description for someone who's visually, uh, visually impaired. So well after the class was done, I, had, I ended up writing a whole other 700 words of long description to tack on to the end of the article to make sure it uh, met with the requirements of accessibility, which again, uh, would never have done if it was just an assignment, but certainly very valuable. And the final stage, the, the, the point I think we ended at, uh, most of us, was that cool, we wrote a textbook. And when we found out that it was actually, uh, Michael was gonna use it as the textbook for the next class of collection management, uh, this is where that sort of higher value really came in. All of the research we did, all of the work, all the studying um, was translating immediately into um, returning that knowledge back to uh, the group. Um, and uh, just as a final note, uh, as a part-time student, I'm still continuing on. Marty, Amy, and Kat all graduated uh, last year. Um, so I'm still a student here. And so in one of the study groups that I'm in, 
uh, we, we sort of meet up and I was like, okay, this is what I need to get run, read today. And what do you need to do in your study group today? And one of my classmates was like, oh yeah, I'm doing collection management. I've got to do my readings for that class. And I was like, really, what are you reading today? And uh, as it happens, my chapter is the first chapter of the book. And so she looked down at scholar and was like, oh, I'm reading the chapter you just wrote in this textbook. So that was an immediate moment of, wow, that was very cool. All that stuff uh, is immediately translating into uh, practical use and spreading that knowledge further. So yeah, it, it's by far one of the best uh, assignments uh, I think I've got to work on because it immediately turned into something real world and practical. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, so uh, I, as you can see, I've put some uh, some gifts in here. Um, just you gotta you gotta get some caps in a presentation to uh, to pick things up. Um, so I I'm gonna talk a little bit about some issues and like pitfalls that came up. Um, but before I do that, I want to like underscore that everything everybody else said about the value of the assignment and like the rewarding nature of it, um, I very much echo as well. Um, so I don't want to sound like I only have bad things to say, but um, I'm sort of focusing on just covering some of these issues. Um, so as Winston said, um, because this was an elevated assignment that went to a wider audience, the stakes were a lot higher, um, which I think means that like when we when we made our groups, we made them for the purposes of doing an assignment that was going to be contained in the class. Um, and so I think that when we then had the opportunity to do this bigger, like more significant assignment, the groups were not necessarily formed for that purpose. And that sort of led to some issues with people staying in contact after the class ended, because I don't think that we all expected to be working on it to the extent that we were. Um, so contact once the semester ended uh, was a big issue, uh, mostly because there was so much editing that we had to think about. Um, and in my case, uh, some of the people in my group went on vacation or uh, were very busy with graduation and other coursework. And so it was difficult for us to coordinate in the same way that we could when we were meeting like every week um, for class. Um, there were also some fumbles with press books um, because none of us had ever used it before. And um, there were also issues with like all of us getting accounts on press books. Like um, we had contacted Dr. McNally because a few people weren't able to edit the documents directly. And that didn't end up getting fixed until quite late into the project. So um, I had to sort of do everything in the press books because my other two uh, members could not. And so some some familiarity with the press books and like as time goes on and more people do it, I'm sure this will not happen, um, but that was a beginning issue. Uh, and also making it a cohesive chapter um, with like the little meeting time we had, because when it's going in a textbook, uh, you really have to make sure that something that's written by like a group of three people like feels like one thing. and I think when it was just within the class, we weren't making it as seamless um, as we would have wanted it to be in a textbook. So um, some suggestions in this regard, I guess, would be um, putting some more like time and space aside for meeting and communication channels after the class ends and uh, being more aware uh, it earlier on in the semester that like this is going to be something that will sort of transcend the class and knowing more of those editorial things to um, get ahead of ahead of time uh, so that we don't have to hash it all out um, kind of at the last minute. Um, but yeah, all in all, uh, it came together and uh, I'm very glad. Thank you, Marty. And uh, and so, yeah, as, as has been mentioned, this textbook's now in use. Uh, and, and I believe this project can continue for a little bit of time. So I've given the, the students in the collection management class this year the option to say, 
Uh, I am willing to consider uh, a second edition and new chapters. I, I don't want anyone to rewrite what exists. Uh, so I've got uh, two excellent chapters, for example, on ebook pricing and licensing. So you know, there isn't really room for anything else there, but uh, there are certainly gaps in the uh, in the content. And so I've said, uh, you know, for the purposes of the course assignment, you can write on whatever you want. Uh, but if you're interested in a, in being part of the second edition, uh, you'll need to think about where where you can fit that in. Uh, and so, you know, it, uh, I think it really does kind of straddle both those sets of benefits uh, that's associated with uh, with open education. It's it's given the students something uh, to do and and to share, uh, to be contributors, and and that uh, kind of reputational intrinsic benefit as well. They do all have a, of a CV line uh, coming out of this. And of course, here's the uh, QR code you could scan to get a, a access to the book. Uh, and, you know, we'll continue to, to see uh, where this uh, project might go, but but happy to share on the, the process and the thoughts and especially grateful for the uh, insights of Amy, oh, and Pat, and Marty, and Winston on, uh, on what makes the process works. Uh, and we do have a few citations if you're interested, uh, but we're happy to take uh, questions at this point. The research that you did it on, that was all like scholarly article. I didn't, I'm sorry, I missed the first little chunk of the meeting. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess they didn't technically have to be scholarly articles, but it was pretty much just like every other paper that we'd done in class. Um, I think Kat and I used some blog posts. Uh, obviously, we weren't going to be using like Wikipedia or anything that wasn't at least semi-professional. But yes, I think most of the things we used were news articles when it came to um, actual newsy stuff like the uh, mergers and I think some other things. And we use publishers for us specifically we use publishers weekly which is um also i guess technically a magazine um and then some academic articles st published studies things like that so yeah excellent thanks did you have I, a style guide did you did you have a style guide from the beginning because you know you mentioned uh, winston mentioned a very important point about accessibility when we're writing assignments we are not always taking into consideration accessibility. So did you have like an accessibility style guide uh, that would help with the consistency uh, because it's a group of students who are working on it, like a group of people? Uh, so I'll, I can I can answer that. Uh, we started with uh, with some a little bit of, of a, a style guide. I would say probably a half page of, of what I called editorial guidance. And by the end of the project, that half page had grown to I think the three and a half pages, uh, just as as the need to bring consistency to things uh, came across. So uh, that was you know different things like terminology. You know, is it ebook with a lowercase e or a capital E. Um, for, right in the assignment, I structured the layout of all the chapters, and that was in part to help give it a textbook feel. So every chapter has an introduction, background, and current context, uh, the challenges in the issue, the responses to the issue, and a little bit of an annotated sources for uh, further reading. So, so some of that went. Uh, in terms of the accessibility, I told the students, uh, since I knew we were going to be using Pressbooks, I don't for the purposes of the assignment uh, within the course, there's no requirements around accessibility. But if you are going to continue afterwards, you might as well think of some of this beforehand. Uh, part of the condition, uh, the, the license that I had to sign with Pressbooks uh, was that uh, we would meet the BC Campus uh, Accessibility Toolkit's appendices uh, on, uh, on accessibility standards. So uh, that brought a number of uh, relatively small, but although in the case of Winston's diagram, that was a larger piece of work, uh, accessibility considerations we had to uh, had to consider. And, and I can answer Janet's question in the chat too. Uh, in terms of student buy-in, I, I let the students know at the beginning uh, 
that this was going to take. If you wanted to see through and get into the textbook, it was going to be more work. Uh, I should note too, I actually tried this in 2018 in a different context in a, in a class uh, that I was teaching where I didn't have some of these benefits like knowing all the students uh, and uh, it, it failed. So I, I knew that the work post course uh, was uh, was going to be significant. That's why I had them do the draft and the final. And I think for everyone here, uh, your chapters were in pretty good shape and the final for the assignment. There, there were a few students who actually had more substantive work to do over the, the uh, period of time in the uh, spring. Uh, but I think it's it's important to you know we had 22 students in the class, 18 of those 22 students contributed uh, to the, the final project. So most, all, all, strong majority of the students participated. Uh, I was really off on the timeline though, because I said we would be done in May uh, and we did not finish until uh, until early August. So it, uh, it certainly took a bit of time. Uh, and before getting to Shelley's question, I'll just stop there in case Winston, Marty, Amy, or Kat have anything else to add. I can maybe add um, just about the work beyond the course. I think part of it really depends on the topic that you did. Um, I think Kat and I were a little bit of a more special case because we were doing things and talking about things that were more current. Um, I know Kat talked about it a little bit, but we had multiple things where we handed in our assignment and then more news would come out and we would wanna add that. So I know we did have potentially a little bit more work than other people because we were actually adding things in writing. So we probably did add some things to it, but it wasn't to the same extent as you know writing the draft, writing the final paper. Um, and we enjoyed it, obviously, so it wasn't as big of a deal. And then to Shelley's question, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, would, this, uh, would you recommend doing this as an advanced undergrad course uh, over the course of one year, two semesters? Uh, it seems like you needed more time and academic help. Maybe the second half of the course uh, could be how to do peer review uh, slash editorial work and how to publish online. And I think, uh, yes, it, it, certainly if you were going to do this at the advanced undergraduate level, uh, two semesters would be uh, a, a really useful way of doing this. Uh, one of the challenges we had is to, to, make, to make this all work in one semester. Uh, it was a fall semester. The uh, the draft, which was the most, you know, that was where the bulk of the writing was, was due before Halloween. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, like last week of October sometime. Uh, and that was, you know, we needed five weeks after the draft came in to facilitate time to uh, send out peer reviews and let those peer reviews come back and then have uh, time in the class for people to incorporate uh, the peer reviews. So, uh, you know, it, and and in terms of the assignments of the course, uh, there was a little bit around participation. There was one other assignment that was due early in October, but the the bulk of the weight in the class was uh, was doing the draft, the peer review, and then the final process. So certainly if you had two semesters, uh, you could spread some of that out a little bit and it wouldn't have been uh, quite as hectic uh, in terms of especially that turnaround from the, the big draft uh, to do the peer reviews and the finals. Uh, and I'll stop there. Kat, Marty, Amy, Winston, anything to add just on the timing? Because you had to you had to go through it. I just set it up. Uh, I guess I would also say that, yeah, I think it would be a great idea to do this with um, with an undergrad class uh, because um, I think getting some experience with like making things for publication and undergrad will make it a lot easier for students like as graduate students to like get more excited about producing things and publishing things. I think that would be a great opportunity. Uh, and then just further to uh, to Celeste's comment, uh, you know, I, I think the accessibility checklist from from BC campus that uh, and, and hats off to Open Education Alberta for requiring that of all of its textbooks really helped us uh, because I'm uh, I'm not an accessibility expert uh, myself, but it gave us a really clear step by step 
uh, process to follow. Uh, and it's a really well-designed uh, checklist. I mean, even down to things of like uh, whether you're hyperlinking the title or hyperlinking the URL uh, in the references section. Uh, so it gave, uh, I think it gave everyone a fairly clear sense of, of what they needed to do uh, and really helped uh, kind of make things more accessible, which of course yeah, in, in regular assignments is not something that's, uh, unless it's a, an assessment criteria, it's not, not often something that's factored in at all. Uh, and the, uh, the title is Contemporary Issues in Collection Management. I can put the URL in the, uh, the chat too. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for sharing your experience um, with uh, reusable assignment, you know, moving into real open pedagogy and um, moving away from disposable uh, assignments. But what was it that really, um, this question is more for Winston, Marty, Amy, and Kat, honestly. What was your main buy-in? Like, why did you agree? Did, to do it. I like Winston, you took all the steps, you know, you mentioned <laughs> not knowing what, you know, even questioning stage five, six, but did I get tricked into uh, doing, you know, like halfway. Um, nobody tricked you, but what was your, um, because, you know, what motivated you to jump in this bus and do it? Because many a times I get into projects, I don't know how much time, if it's a new thing, you don't know. Even if somebody tells you other people's case study, it's going to take, a lot more time. So if you're saying yes to something, you're going to say no to something in life. Um, yeah, you know, um, like, was it the excitement? Was it open pedagogy? Was it total trust in the power of your professor? Because it's the power and privilege which instructors have when they're grading you. What was your main motivation to, to jump into this project? I mean, I can speak a little on my perspective and I basically was like I don't think I'll have an opportunity like I'm not that interested in sort of I haven't been that involved in much work that would be published um, and that's probably not my the career trajectory that I was eyeballing to start and then this opportunity came up and I was like that sounds really cool uh, I could be published <laughs> have a something to put on my resume um but also it just it's, I just thought it was a cool idea and like we had said we all knew Michael and we had had classes with him before so I personally felt like I knew him as a professor and I trusted the class and his direction um and so yeah I thought it was kind of a almost like a no-brainer a lot of me and Amy had talked about it and we're like yeah we're gonna do this right <laughs> so Well, I, I guess I'll just jump in and say that uh, I, I think part of it probably helps that we are all library students and uh, now graduated librarians. And so part of our basic approach to the world is wanting to share the stuff we know. And uh, if there's one thing I've loved about my fellow library students, we're all a bunch of nerds that just love talking to people about the stuff that we're learning. And so uh, I think for me that was a part of it as well uh, is that it was a chance for us to actually tell more people about the cool stuff that we were learning. Um, I think uh, in addition to what everybody else has said, uh, there was also um, just being able to deliver what you have to say in an assignment to a wider audience because I think there is sometimes you write things in a paper that you you know you feel like uh it's it's great that I wrote about this but unfortunately only the prof is going to see it um and in my case I wrote about challenges to um to us LGBTQ plus collections um which is something that is it continues to develop and and be a serious issue in libraries so 
I was really happy that I could publish something about that so that as it develops, librarians can read it and hopefully gain something from it or gain some inspiration. Um, and it just, yeah, the, like the kind of the excitement of being able to contribute to the literature um, was a big motivator for me, I think. Um, I guess since everyone else has gone, I'll also go. Um, we were kind of told throughout the whole process that we didn't have to do it. It was something that we could do. Um, and I think um, Kat and I were kind of like, of course, we want to do this. That's, that's no brainer. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we do terrible, we don't really <laughs> want to disseminate it to everybody. Um, so I think for us anyways we kind of had that whole process of we're gonna do it we're gonna do it we handed it in did all of this we were starting to write more and more and not to speak for cat but i think it's probably the most proud i've ever been of an assignment and part of that um, made me excited to actually have the chance to publish it because it was such a long paper longer i think than anything i've ever written before um and also Personally, I think the writing was pretty good in it and Kat and I worked really well together. So it was just exciting to have that chance, like Marty said, to actually get it out there, so. And I see Janet's question on uh, on things you do differently next time around. So I think having more of the editorial guidance uh, and, and encouraging the students, as Marty said, to think about group dynamics after the course ends. Uh, I think that's a really important insight uh, you know, obviously Amy and Kat were very close, so that that worked, I think, very well for them. Uh, I think in other cases, you know, that uh, that distance uh, is a little bit more challenging. I think one of the, the things that uh, I would certainly do differently in relation to press books and just the way Open Education Alberta is set up, I needed to get a sub license from every single person. Uh, and at the time, actually, and I, I should acknowledge uh, both Sarah Shaughnessy and Michelle Braley uh, at the University of Alberta Libraries who helped with the project as well. Uh, at the time, I was working with Michelle, uh, and I said, you know, is there a template for this? So there wasn't there were, wasn't even a template for the sub license. And between Michelle and myself and the copyright office, we developed one. Uh, but then I sent them out, and and I got six or seven back right away. And so we went to add those users because all the users had to be added uh by by the library to the press book i didn't have control over that process and it created this really slow process whereby at first just seven people had the ability to edit the textbook i think marty kind of did a lot of the editing for uh you know their group and then uh you know i got another seven added and then i chased down the last uh handful of authors from there uh so you know some of those uh streamlining uh, kind of processes behind the scene that I wasn't aware of, I think, were the, the biggest pieces uh, to uh, to think about. Uh, and maybe to tell the students, too, that, uh, you know, doing this, having it done in May was a little keen, uh, that it would probably take into, uh, you know, June and July uh, would have helped. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe for the students, uh, there was a little bit of time after those courses ended in in April in particular, uh, where there was a little bit of time to do some work. And so there, you know, there wasn't a huge rush uh, per se, but but being a little bit more generous on the fact that it's going to take, uh, you know, eight months post course rather than uh, five. Uh, Janet, uh, so that's that's the thing that it the timeline and the agreements to sign is what you are adding to Janet's um, question. Yeah, yeah, the timeline being being uh, giving a longer timeline to the post course work and uh, and some of those kind of the sub licensing agreement, uh, which of course that was an open education Alberta piece and it's an important piece, uh, but it wasn't something that I went in uh, thinking was going to be a big, uh, a big source of uh, of delay, and 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 to be honest, I think uh, you know we overwhelmed the uh, the library side of things too. They haven't had a press book where they've needed to add 19 users uh, to it, so uh, there was a little bit of a of a process uh, issue or challenge for everyone there, uh, you know. But 
uh, got a lot of support uh, and very happy with uh, with the help from both Sarah and Michelle. Thank you, everyone. This was really nice to hear about and uh, something I wish I had in my MLIS program. So good on y'all. Uh, well done. You know, M Michael, take the credit for it because, you know, you are our, our champion for open education. The very reason you are able to motivate um, people to follow you, you know, leaders need leaders, leaders need followers. And you have a team of this panel of students who are sharing their story, you know. So do take credit for the work uh, you've done. And to the to Winston, Marty, Amy, and Kat, I'm uh, really proud of you. Um, you know, you have a competitive advantage in the job market. You have it on your resume. And most important, you're contributing to the profession, you know, this um, body of knowledge not only Mardi, it is amplifying your voice or your passion. You know, it's about social justice. Um, you have, um, you know, you're contributing to a greater cause. I think the profession, we don't really sometimes think about contributing, um, you know, to the profession. For me as a librarian, uh, you know, as an immigrant librarian, 